Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. I first heard of Paul Selig several years ago when I was living in Boulder and somebody mentioned his books to me and I was really taken with this series of channeled books that Paul has put out into the world. It's always nice to meet a fellow channeler and to talk to them about their experiences, but Paul has built a real name and body of work over the last years and he is the first person I have seen in a long time who has created a body of work in terms of channeled books. So it was really wonderful to sit down and talk to Paul about his experience doing this work and what it's like for him as a public channeler and workshop leader. So please enjoy this conversation with Paul Selig. You are a busy man and, um, you know, I, I know everybody is busy, but one of the things that I marvel at with you is how many live workshops and live events I see you doing. And mm -hmm. I've just watched you do this for years, mm -hmm. that you're out on the road meeting people, doing your work. Did you ever imagine this is what you would be doing? No, I was a college teacher. You know, I did a little group that met in my apartment for 18 years, um, but I wasn't looking to be known as a channeler. Um, it was this sort of thing that I did quietly because I wanted to keep my, my academic life. So this is still a bit of a surprise yeah. that this is now how I live and how I work. So when did it happen for you? When did you tap into the side of yourself that, that could channel? Well, it, it was a process for me. I, I started opening up psychically when I was about 25. I had quit drinking and I had quit partying and all of a sudden I started seeing little lights around people. Mm. And, um, and the clairaudience really came forth that when I was about 30, 31, and I was, I'd studied a form of energy healing, and I found that when I had my hands on people's bodies, I could gain information for them, and they would confirm it. So once I began to trust the validity of the information, I began to open up more, and that's when the channeling began. They didn't start lecturing through me until about 2008, I'd been a heavy smoker, and when I quit the cigarettes, which they told me I had to do, and they rarely tell me I have to do anything, but they pretty much said, we would love to keep working with you. However, you know, you have to attend to this. Once that was out, they began lecturing and dictating these books, and, um, and it's been nonstop. But it was really about my willingness to, to show up for the work, and because I'm now fully willing, that's what I do, they're showing up all the time. And that's how it's happened. And you've just published your seventh book. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I was just sharing with you before, before we started that you came across my radar, I think it was around 2013, 2014, and I'd self-published a book. Mm -hmm. So I was seeing the channeling charts on Amazon the mm -hmm. week it came out. And your books really caught my attention because number one, you already had a few. Number two, they were great titles, great covers. And number three, I hadn't seen anybody at that point since perhaps um, Jane Roberts and the Seth books, Cryon possibly, but I, Cryon wasn't quite as mainstream as I was noticing. Your books were connecting with people and more importantly, you were giving people a journey. It wasn't just mm -hmm. one book or mm -hmm. one theme. It was, you were taking people through this teaching process mm -hmm. and people were really gravitating towards it. Now I, I see how, how much that, that has grown over the years. Do you, do you yourself feel like a student of the work or do you feel like some of it has integrated over the years or? I mean, some has integrated. I, I, I tend to make a point of, of letting people know that I don't consider myself to be a spiritual teacher. That's really not my work. I'm a radio and I'm in broadcast when I'm channeling and I'm in broadcast when I'm working psychically. I seem to be sort of a switchboard oh. and I can plug into the guides and they can come through or I can plug into the people that come to me and want to know about their own lives and I'm hearing them or the people in their lives. But, you know, the process of, of, of integrating these teachings is the challenge for me. I mean, it's none of what they're bringing through is convenient. It's not easy. It's not convenient. It's really about letting go of 
the ideas one holds about who and what one is and how the universe works. So I knew when they said that they had a book to write, um, which was two days before, and it was a surprise, you know, I had just gotten let go of from a job and I had gone to bed and a colleague of mine from my academic life called me and said, you know, Paul, this might be a good time for you to write that memoir about how you became clairaudient. And I had no desire to write anything again. As long as I live, I'd been a playwright. So I said no, and the guides piped in and said, no, we have a book to write. And if you take two weeks, we'll do it. And at that moment, I had nothing to lose. But one of the things that they said when they were dictating that first book is that they, they, they use the term Christ sometimes in their teachings and their definition of it is the aspect of the creator that can be realized in material form. That's the who and the what that one is an expression. And they said, well, that's an event that happens. And I, I didn't know what that meant. I thought they were saying, well, we get to be a little more spiritual and maybe a little happier, a little kinder to one another. And in fact, this whole process of the book's coming is really a journey towards that level of, of incarnation or embodiment or realization. So I'm along for the ride. You know, I have to put it that way. I don't always feel that I'm the best student of the work, but I do consider myself a student. I, I think it's interesting being friends with several channelers and having my own experience as a channeler. I so, everything you just said is so true. And I, and I think one of the things that I've often relayed to people who perhaps listen to my channel material or other people's channel material is that that's okay. It's like mm -hmm. we're not going to be in the unembodied state that our guides are in, mm -hmm. but what they are doing is leading us to this future point. And I often feel like we're a, and the Zs have even said this, that we're a bridge, that those of us yeah. that are learning to uh, integrate as much of this as we can now are bridging for the next generation and, mm -hmm. and really clearing the ancestral pain that mm -hmm. we have come through and, and grown through. Mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, did you have much reticence when the, uh, particularly when the first book came out, were you, mm -hmm. did you, did you have a, you know, personal process around standing behind this channeling work? Mm -hmm. It, there's been a challenge for me in that my name is on the covers of all these books that I haven't written. I mean, the books are all the unedited transcripts of, of the dictation. There's maybe three words that are corrected in any book, and that's usually a word that I mispronounced mm -hmm. or I didn't know and I stumbled over or I added an S to when it shouldn't have been pluralized. I mean, it really has been very clear, you know, in terms of how they brought this through and how cleanly so the challenge for me was of being known for this. Um, it was one thing to do the work in my apartment with a small group of people who would show up every week and we'd be in the energy and the guides would teach and something else to be able to say, well, yeah, this is kind of one of the ways I, I express myself in the world. I expected real backlash from academia and I didn't get it, hmm. which was really a delight. Most people just sort of I think accepted it or rolled their eyes or, you know, were quietly disdainful. But my life continued on. And uh, the process for me of sort of accepting that this is what I do now continues. Yeah. You know, I'm still surprised by it. I'm still surprised that people are reading these books and, and having positive experiences through them. Yeah. It's, it's funny because everything you just said is, again, so conversations I've had with friends. It, it is strange also when you are viewed sometimes as the message, mm -hmm. as the messenger, and, and having to kind of uh, bridge that with people or, or explain. Uh, I, I often have that with people asking me about things that have come through disease, assuming mm -hmm. that I know the answer. And I'm like, uh -huh. I, don't, I don't really know. I don't quite know what they meant by that quote yeah. exactly, or I, I have a sense of it, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's actually true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I do the same thing. And yeah. people are sometimes, you know, moderately appalled. Yeah. I mean, there was a woman once in a workshop of mine who asked a question like that, and I said, I, I don't remember what they were talking about. And she said, you really don't read these books. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, I dictate them, and I get so tired of the sound of my voice, I proofread them. The first time I really read the book as a, in, in sequence, in, 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 in a full experience is when I do the audio books and I have to, it's mm -hmm. in front of me. And then I really understand the trajectory of the teaching. Mm. Um, but it's a funny experience, I think, for people that do what we do because 
we're really there in service. And, you know, at least in my case, I know my vocabulary is being utilized and my consciousness is being utilized. But I, I do experience myself as in the back seat of the car, you know, for the entirety of the transmission. So I can't pretend to be the driver, you know, even once it's out in the world. Absolutely. And yet it's interesting because you mentioned no kickback from academia. And for me, one of the signatures of your work mm -hmm. is this uh, very high level of language. And of course, I think every channeler has to have some ability with language. Otherwise, you haven't necessarily got the skill set required for guides mm -hmm. or other entities to come through you. But mm -hmm. that really struck me in reading your latest book and just getting a sense of what you do. The, the, it's almost Shakespearean, the language, in, in many ways. And so it's interesting to me that they chose you and you chose this contract or perhaps you chose to study being a playwright and an academic before as part of the preparation yeah. for this. I think it was part of the preparation. I wouldn't have known it at the time, but the idea of hearing character or becoming character was part of being a playwright. And I never connected it mm. with the two. I was asked maybe... 10 years ago, what was the connection? I said, there wasn't any. There were completely different episodes. But back in the days when I was a playwright, which was when I was young, I used to put one piece of music on, on loop for hours. And I was inducing trance and just sort of writing. You know, it didn't occur to me that when I stepped into channeling or stepped into somebody else, that it was really happening until it happened. I was actually reading for somebody and she mentioned her father's name and I tuned into him and she gasped. I said, what's the matter? She said, you look just like him. And that's one of the strange things that I do is I can step into other people and resemble them and become them, you know, through the work. So the verification from that stuff was really helpful mm -hmm. for me to say, well, this is the guides, this is how they're teaching. And, you know, occasionally they use language that I don't know, which is rare, but in the book that they just finished dictating, Early on, there was a word that I didn't know and I didn't want to repeat it because I knew if I said it, it was in the book and I wouldn't say it, you know, and they kept saying, it's in the text. They say, Paul is hearing a word and he's refusing to speak it. And the word was penumbra, which is actually a very good word. It's a real word. I just had never used it in my life. So right. I had no idea. We looked it up. After the channeling, it was the perfect word for the lecture. It means, I think, the light that expresses outside of you know, the shadow, what, what appears beyond the, the eclipse, I suppose, would be the penumbra. So I didn't know. So, you know, That's we're still trying, trying to figure out how to work this stuff. That's great. You mentioned you embodying people. Yeah. And it's interesting. I have a good friend. I spoke to her a few days ago and she asked me what was going on with my week. And I said, oh, this week, Paul Selig's coming in. I'm going to meet him for the first time. We're going to do the podcast. And she went, oh, I had a reading with him. It really helped me. I was having a real issue with my sister mm -hmm. and Paul got into the consciousness of my sister and spoke from my sister's mm -hmm. consciousness mm -hmm. and then spoke from mine and it helped me see something. And I, I really love that because not many people do that. And I think that's a really interesting embodied channeling mm -hmm. mediumship um, aspect of what you do. Do you do that live in the room at your workshops too? Mm -hmm. I uh -huh. do, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've been called a medium for the living. I'm not the person that's going to tune into your, your, your deceased aunt. But mm. if she's living and you haven't spoken to her for a few years, I can probably get her and, and become her. It's interesting for me. I mean, I like doing that work because of the immediacy of it. Mm. And also, you know, I'm used in a very different way than when I'm channeling. When I'm channeling, and especially when I'm channeling a book, I'm really just taking dictation. There's no interpretation whatsoever. And I'm very clear about that being my role. When I'm stepping into somebody, I'm having to read my own experience and my body is being used in, in different ways. So if I tune into somebody and I do that, you know, I know they're angry, yeah. you know, or that means they're pushing away. And there's, you know, all of these symbols that, that, that come up, but it's an interesting way to work. And um, I don't know why even I mentioned that, but that's kind of, you know, what my experience is now between the two. The primary work is the channeling and, and the more psychic work, which I consider that form of mediumship to be, you know, augments it well because huh. it gives me a whole other experience of what Claire audience is and, and can be. Yeah. What are the hazards for you physically doing this work, if there are any? 
I don't know, truthfully, and I should know, and I don't. I'm not a trained channel, you know. I, I wasn't mentored in this process. My central nervous system seems to be what's used. And for me, it's a very physical process. Occasionally, I see people who are channeling that feel, you know, very comfortable, and maybe they've just integrated the higher. And, you know, my experience is m becoming much more like that. But for a very long time, it was this somewhat jarring mm. experience. I used to rock a lot when I channeled. I looked like I was at the Wailing Wall and I was rolling back and forth. There was a period where I only could channel on my feet because there was so much energy moving through me. And I would be walking in a circle with my eyes closed. I would work with people in a large circle and I'd be walking around like a chicken with his head cut off. <laughs> babbling, you know, in this British accent in those days. You have one. My guides seem to have one when, so when you want one. So you're still British now? They come, there's one that comes through on occasion quite joyously, and he has, he's the one that I used to call the guy with the accent. And, uh -huh. and because he had such a joy in his expression, and he was the one that would always talk about singing and music, hmm. you know, and, and that was his vocabulary. And it still shows up. I mean, I think there was a period of time, because I actually had to ask, do you really have an accent or are you just doing this? Because mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe perhaps there's a distinction that's being made for me to sort of separate. And um, I'm very aware of the fact that the vocabulary is so consistent in the, in the books with or with the, without the accent. It's always the same. So I don't know, but yes, it does come. Yeah. So. The physical process has changed. My eyes, I'm told, turn bright blue when I'm channeling, and which is interesting, you know, and I, I have hazel eyes. But the wear and tear, I don't understand, you know. I, you know, I think, you know, my sensitivity, which is, my, which is just sort of the empath piece, the ability to feel so much, has, you know, been hard for me much of my life, right. you know, and I put on some padding and I, I protect myself in ways that I don't think are all that necessary anymore. But I don't know what the process is. Mm. And, and I know that there are people that do know, mm. you know, and that there's a level of self-care that one requires. I also do it for a long time. I mean, if I'm doing a, a, a workshop, I'm channeling for five hours a day. Yeah. And, you know, most of it, a third of that might be lecture you know, yeah. from the guides. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, everything you say resonates. I think that, I think also we seem to be at some kind of turning point right now around sensitives, empaths and self-care. And I mm -hmm. think the amount of information and consciousness that's out there for those of us who identify in that way is part of the turning point. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, um, earlier we talked and I was just marveling at your travel schedule and you said, well, when I'm home, I tend to borrow yeah. and I so relate to that. Like mm -hmm. we'll go and do an event and my extrovert side will handle everything mm -hmm. unless I'm in the hotel room and then I come home and my introvert just goes like this to try and kind of recalibrate and recover. Mm -hmm. um, because as you said, the central nervous system definitely takes a hit. Um, and I think that's true even for people in the, in the room, not necessarily mm -hmm. the channeler at the front. Yeah. I think those kinds of energetic events um, really, really shift things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how are you feeling about book number seven? And I don't necessarily mean the content. I mm -hmm. just mean this is your seventh rodeo. Things are growing. How are you feeling about what you're experiencing through this work in the world right now? The work seems to be catching on in a different way. And I'm pleased about that. And I'm surprised by that. There's a whole younger audience that seems to be discovering the work, and I'm seeing them show up, and I'm, I'm happy for that. What they're teaching now is challenging for me on a personal level, because it really does mean, if what they're saying is true, and at this point they've been so consistent through all the books that I have to assume that they are speaking the truth and know what they're, they're teaching, really is addressing a level of ability that we really all have to sort of re-know what reality is mm -hmm. in a very experiential way. I mean, the guides have never been, I think, the ones to, you know, do self-help. I don't think that that's what they're here for. They're teachers and they're teaching 
it's really almost a form of mysticism, of, of embodiment and realization of the divine in all manifestation. So I'm having to contend with my own process through this in a very different way. In the seventh book, they started talking about what they call the upper room, which, mm. you know, they, they say is another octave. It's the, it's the octave above where we're all operating from. They don't really talk about dimensions, so it may be the same as, as other people are speaking to. Um, but they really sort of establish it and bring us there in this book. And I'm looking back on the books prior, and I see that they were really all in preparation for our ability to hold this other consciousness. And they've dictated an eighth book since then, which nearly killed me. I mean, I've never been through a process like that with a book, which was really all about the process of, 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 of re-articulation. They say that everything in form, you, I, the trees out the window, all these things, it's all the divine in articulation. It's all God in expression. And that the denial of God, or whatever you want to call God, is the only real problem that we're facing. And so the process of, of this teaching is about the realization of that, but that has to come at the cost of our understanding of how complicit we've been in that denial, which mm. is my self-hatred, the denial of others, mm. my fear, all the things that I use to sort of deny source. So my process of being in the world with a new book is actually now the process of, of beginning to understand that where they're taking us is to a place that at least I have never thought I could come to. Huh. And I don't, it's not that I feel like I have to stand by or defend the work, I really don't. This is the work, this is what it is, this is who I am, I'm not the author, I'm, I'm party to it. So I'm at a funny place right now where I'm aware that the work seems to be catching on. And I'm still surprised, truthfully, after all of these events that I do, that anybody still shows up. Hmm. You know, I don't know, like, I don't know what I'm doing there, you know, and I, I don't know, you know, that it's imposter syndrome. I had dinner with some friends last night who were talking about, you know, what the work had meant to them. And I and were surprised that I didn't get that. And I said, well, I think I'm more like a, a savant, you know? It just sort of happens. And I go, what the hell was that? Because I've never finished a channeling and go, boy, that was a good channeling. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. It really is allowing the experience to come through. And I remember maybe a third of what they've talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, the rest of it's sort of gone. So. And then I feel, you know, there I am. I'm just this sort of ex-college teacher who's having this baffling experience that's very public now in front of others. And for some reason, my guys seem to dictate books like this, like litters of puppies, you know, you know, one a year. It takes three months and usually 30 days in those three months where the dictation happens. It used to be continuous days, two weeks four hours a day, three hours a day, whatever it was, that was the entire book. You know, it was done in two weeks of dictation. And now, now they do the books publicly in front of students, in front of the audiences, so, which is a relief yeah. for me. So I'm just, it's easier because we're already there and it's already happening. But yeah. fortunately, I'm not channeling every day, so. You built the foundation. And, yeah. and for the students who already love the books, the idea of being in the room when a book is being created and being part of that in a way is a thrill. Yeah, I think so that's so. fantastic. Um, it's funny, as you were talking, I w I, you, you were sharing how you were feeling, and I, I just was like, oh, 2020. Really? It's going to be a massive year for you. Oh, dear. But no good. Okay. <laughs> good. No, really Thank good, because it's interesting. Some of the things you were talking about, um, how do I put this? Several years ago, we went to... Um, Tulum, and I was, I was part of a Law of Attraction cruise. It was 2012, and we went to Tulum, and the people that we met all around Tulum and on the way into Tulum were quite... Um, they, were, they, were, they were varied, but they were quite, like, earthy and quite grounded and quite dense in a way. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in Tulum, I did a channel, and the, the Zs explained that places of high frequency have to be grounded with density, mm -hmm. and that that's the way it has always been on the planet thus far, and that that's going to change in the coming decades. But that's why you'll often see a certain level of groundedness 
wherever there is a height of light. And I was thinking for you, you know, the, the, the groundedness and the stamina that you have is what's allowing all of this to come through you as you were talking. But I also thought, oh, yeah, 2020 is going to be some of the things that you were saying. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I just felt it would all come together for you next year in a different way. I see a transformation for you personally in tandem with all of this energy that's coming at you around the work. It feels, feels very good and it feels like you reinventing certain things. So I don't want to impose that, but that was what came to me as you were talking. You, you know, it, it feels right, yeah. what you're saying. And, um, you know, the, the moment when somebody says it's going to be a big year, I go, okay, I'm going to hide under a couch. But I know that too. No, I get you know, it. because it means probably more visibility. Yeah. And the visibility, you know, I, I used to watch your, your energy broadcast and I would say, oh, he's so lovely. You know, what a lovely oh. man. He's sharing himself so easily with the world. And... You know, and at the time, you know, getting me to channel in front of five people at once would have been a feat, you know. I would do it in my apartment. And right. so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that some of us, you know, have that grace, you know. And um, it's never been my, my, my strong suit, you know, so. Well, it seems like you're, you're, you're out there doing that. And I'd love to pick up on visibility next. Uh -huh. It's interesting you would say that to me because that wasn't always my experience. Mm -hmm. and, and just like you, I think the, the two things, I, I always had a bit of a fear of visibility and my guides said to me way back in 2012, they were like, oh, this work is just gonna become more visible and so are you and it would, it would recoil me. And so I yeah. had to kind of, I had to work on that, my own ego, my own fear. Um, and, and, and the way, the one thing I always try and say to people is, I think we all have this innate fear of visibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not really met, I've met a few people and they're probably the same. I've met two channelers who will talk about how wonderful their latest channels are. And I've been blown away because mm -hmm. I, like you, I, I don't, I mean, I, I feel that I can feel there's a good vibration, but I don't go back and study it and mm -hmm. I don't tend to, but I've met a couple who really love their channeling and they read it and they listen back mm -hmm. to it. And that's not really me. So there are some people out there who I think are primed for that. But I actually think for me, and I'm sure for you and for most people watching who, if you create on a public level, that's a growth path like no other. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. not only do you have to be willing to enter into a new level of interaction with people, which is very different to a one-on-one, -on -one, or even being in the room with people when you're putting stuff out online. But also I think it's a great teaching about the very stuff that the guides would talk about, which is the strangeness of our own perceptions. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that very clearly when you do public work. Mm -hmm. you, you see very clearly how it's never about you. Sometimes it might mm -hmm. tweak a wound of yours, yeah. in which case they're serving you and you go, oh, that hurt. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll look at that. Mm -hmm. But many times you'll see certain comments or, and you'll think, wow, what an interesting choice that someone's making to... Wow. And I think that's the interesting thing about public visibility. It is the unknown, uh, what you're surrendering yourself to. Mm -hmm. For you, when you were younger, had you been a playwright who was publicly known, would that have been more comfortable? I don't know, you know, I mean, I, in retrospect, don't even know how. I was, you know, I started writing plays in college. I was good at it, so I went to graduate school for it, and that was sort of it. And then I, I had some success as a kid, and then I, you know, was sort of publicly self-destructing in some ways. I was a little rock and roll playwright. I had, you know, platinum blonde Billy Idol hair, and, you know, and I, I... I started to, you know, I, I entered a spiritual path not by any choice. I was raised an atheist, you know, it wasn't what I was, or an agnostic. I say atheist, you know, because, you know, we were taught to really look down mm. on people who had spiritual lives. I didn't know what a spiritual life was, but I came to mine really out of necessity and started praying um, for the first time in my life. And when I did, I actually heard a voice a few days later telling me to get my act together, and I did. And that surprised me. So I don't recall what your question was now, because I just went off on this 
this, this sort of aside. I was curious if public life would have been easier for you if you were the more socially accepted playwright. I was a rock and roll playwright. Right. I mean, I was, you know, I was an interview magazine with my platinum blonde hair back yeah. in the day when that was the place you wanted to be. Yeah. And then I became enormously invisible. I mean, college teachers in some ways aren't the people that are you're going to pick out of the crowd, you know, and I was embarking on a, a study, on a, a spiritual study, really, and, and in some ways the teaching that I did was my practice. Mm. I mean, that's really where I learned to love, was in the classroom, mm. and, um, and what that meant, and for it not to be about me and mm. somebody else's benefit. I mean, the odd thing with what I do is, you know, the gifts that have shown up or the abilities that have shown up have always been shown up in service to others. Mm. You know, I'm not always feeling like, you know, I'm getting what I would like informationally for myself. Um, at times I get steered and I get taught and I get encouraged not to make choices in fear. But that other life, I, I, I suppose, you see, that was all about becoming other people too, you know, that, that work, that kind of writing. And, and this is a very different thing because this was the difference, truthfully. When I was doing that work and I wrote something that I felt good about, I took credit for it. I patted myself on the back, job well done. And now I can't in the same way. It's such a different and skewered relationship. And I also, when I channel, I'm not, I'm not the most elegant expression of channeling. I whisper the words, I repeat them. Sometimes it's a mile a minute. And many people, when they first encounter my work, are, are turned off by the transmission. And this is just how it comes. Maybe one day it'll come a little differently. And I've had to get used to the fact that I look ridiculous to many mm. people when I do this. The first time I was ever interviewed, um, the interview was cut up in little clips and put up on YouTube by the guy who interviewed me um, with these headlines like Paul Selling channeling on ET realities, which of course is something that my guides even talk about. <laughs> and the comments, and there's this big man rocking in a chair, whispering and repeating. I mean, the comments were merciless, yeah. merciless. And of course, I had waited to see what people think, mm -hmm. you know. And I said to the guides I work with, I said, you know, if you want me to do, do this work, why are you letting this happen? Yeah. That was my, my, my one request. And they said, well, as long as you think, as long as you care what people think about you, this is going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. It was my work. It was my work to get past it. And the good news is I've stopped caring in a lot of ways. I can't. I show up as I do. That's what I can offer. I can't pretend to be more involved than I am. It doesn't do me or anybody else any good. And, and, and that's the work, you know. Other people may be farther along and can celebrate that. And, you know, I'm just, you know, here to, here to take, the, take the dictation as it's given. But I think that's beautifully authentic. And I, I, I remember, I so relate to the issue because my ego mm -hmm. has, uh, has, softened and melted around standing for what I do. You know, yeah. something like the energy updates, fine. Uh -huh. You're a bit weird. You're still a bit weird because you're talking about energy and occasionally there'll be a comment like, I thought this was going to be a report about gas, you know? But um, the, the channeling is a whole other thing. And, and one of the things I always thought when I first heard and saw myself channeling was, you know, if I, if I was faking it, I would have done a much better accent and a much better performance. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It was like I would, I would have been a bit more sophisticated. And I think there is something. Um, and my channeling is fairly smooth by most standards. It, it was more jerky at the beginning, and then it smoothed out more. Um, but still, I think, I think it is a gift to, to actually be able to stand, especially if, like myself, and it sounds like you too there's some fear that you have about the way you're going to be perceived or judged because mm -hmm. of it. It's kind of liberating to go, oh, well, whatever, yeah. you know, you kind of, it, it, that will happen from this quarter, but this quarter are really grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to touch on, you mentioned your friends and how much the work had impacted them. I, I really believe that as a creator, it's kind of none of our business what mm -hmm. our work is doing for something else. But mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a personal pleasure I deride from hearing that something I did helped someone, mm -hmm. not necessarily because I take it on me, but because I'm so grateful 
to all the authors, musicians, artists who are the light moment for me when I need it. So I, I always kind of think that it's, it's a lovely thing to be contributing to the wheel of transformation that I use every day and benefit from. It's kind of, that, but that's as far as I, I really feel we can ever go with it. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I think what you're saying about, it, it's hard to try and take ownership. I, I wonder if it would be hard to take ownership as perhaps a self-help author who has sat there and crafted the words, although I know a lot of them channel and they mm -hmm. just don't mm -hmm. talk about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's different. I, I tend to make the distinction with channeling, you know, because it's not crafted, because I don't get to go back and fix it and mm -hmm. make it my own, you know, and put my, my spin on it. That's been important. It's been my agreement with the guides. Other people may work differently, but my feeling was if this is to be an authentic transmission, I don't get to go back. Mm. And so I don't, mm. you know? And the hard part is it makes the process of channeling a book a little bit more like a tightrope walk for me because if I, they were to say, and you know, by the way, the moon really is made of green cheese, I, I know it's stuck there in the book. You know, I can't go back, so I'm going to have to say, hey, wait a minute. And then they're going to have to respond, you know, in the text. And in fact, they've done that. And I often do interrupt the teachings when it's too large a concept for me or I, I, I worry that they might have contradicted something. And then they'll go and they'll explain, you know, exactly what they mean. In the first book at one point, early in the book, they, they sent me out to, they said, you know, we're going to go pull out to the shed outside with a magazine. They sent me to the outhouse so that they could just dictate. They said, go read a magazine and let us just do this. And I love being out of the way. And as I've continued to do this work, I'm far more out of the way because, you know, I, it's like surfing. You just keep letting the words come, you know, and not think about the meaning or, or the, the import or, or even the application. Because I hear in phrases you know, still, and maybe again, that changes one day. It's phrase, phrase, phrase. So I'm whispering the phrase and, and repeating it in a louder voice as it comes and the next phrase is coming through and it cycles through like this in this crazy way. So I don't understand that there's been any consistency to the teaching until I see the whole thing typed up and I go, oh, it all makes sense. And the people that are listening have learned to, to listen to the through line in these things. So. You know, it's it's a funny thing, but, you know, nobody tells anybody how to channel. I think one mm -hmm. does it, and and that's the end of it. Yeah. And have the guides ever talked to you about your relationship with them? Have they described prior lifetimes or what's it, what the connection is? You know, I don't inquire much, and when they've done this, they've done it in the books mostly because when I'm doing a book, I can't interrupt. In a public channeling, I can't interrupt and say, I don't want to hear this now because it's going to come. But they basically say it's something that I agreed to prior mm -hmm. to coming and that I am of them, whether or not I know it. So I've been working with them, with this collective, prior. Um, when I was a small boy, when I was five, I had a an experience, maybe five, but I would have been, my brother was still in a crib and he's two years younger. So figure it out, in that vicinity, maybe, you know, three to three to five years old, six at the latest. I, I was an experience of a being hovering over the bed and I was being ta taught by it. It was teaching me, it was speaking to me as I looked up to it. And then I remember floating in the ceiling, looking down at my body, having the conversation. It was the only out-of-body experience I ever had, and I talked to my family about it. It was a big deal. And sometimes I think I was being told in some way, you know, what to expect. My childhood wasn't terribly happy. It was difficult in a lot of ways. And there would be these interesting periods that would later show up. I, I taught at Goddard College and for many years, and I'm on the board now. And when I was nine years old, which was a really rough year, I dreamt about the college. And then I saw it when I was 13. And then when I was 31 or 30, I got a call inviting me to apply for a job there. I thought, this is really weird, you know? But it's still a special place. So I've had these markers 
throughout my life to perhaps give me the understanding that this has all been part of it. Mm. The guide's work with me has all been sort of in preparation, you know, even when I didn't see it. Mm. And that gives me some comfort. Mm. How are your family with the, the who, you know, how, how are they with what you do? My mom's still living. My father's been dead since I was young. My mom's living. And I think she, I occasionally get these emails from her she can't read the books. Mm. She can't forgive anybody, she says. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's too hard for her. She yeah. just can't do it. And, um, and, and she speaks about me as if I'm somebody that she doesn't really know because her son does this weird form of service. And my brother, who, you know, is, 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 lives in this city and... You know, he once said to me, well, you know, I can't compete with the prophets, so we're no longer competing with each other, which I thought was kind of a great thing <laughs> for him to say. And he is reading the books, which I think is quite wonderful. That's great. They're, they're, they're both supportive of it. Um, you know, it's... I, 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 and I don't know why. I've never been some guy who presented... I'm not, you know, wearing a turban with a big crystal, mm -hmm. you know, on my head. And, you know, I, I just show up... I've had a somewhat conventionally appearing background with mm. my academic life, but, you know, my, I've always been a little out there, so yeah. this is just the latest iteration, yeah. I suppose, for the family. I remember about eight, nine years ago, there was a, a channel I did in, in, a, in a workshop room somewhere, and I'm paraphrasing the quote now, but they said something like, um, and don't worry about coming out to your family about being spiritual um, or, you know, X, Y, or Z, um, because they will have always known you were a bit weird. This will just be the confirmation. Yeah. And it was interesting. I remember coming out and I go, oh, yeah, that's really, you know, there's something in the signature that, that people don't recognize or that they may have to navigate. It, it's in the signature of our energy field anyway. It's mm -hmm. just it suddenly becomes concretized when we take an action step or become a certain thing or person. So. Mm -hmm. So what do you like to do, just as Paul? W what are your interests as a human, a human just going through the planet? Like when you do get downtime, what, what interests or intrigues you? Art, entertainment, anything? You know, it is art and yeah. it is, I'll go to the movies and I'll spend yeah. time with the dog who I'm mm -hmm. nuts about. And you know, I, but it's a quiet life. And I have to find a hobby I've been told because before this became my work, and you know, my livelihood now, it's what I show up for and do. Um, it was my hobby mm. and I wasn't looking to, to be doing this all the time. So I actually am aware right now of a deficit or a lack of balance, you know? And it's not that I'm, I'm working so hard because I don't have anything else to do. It's that I have to sort of rediscover some of these things within this sort of lifestyle that I've created for myself. So, yeah, I mean, I'm quiet, you know, I stay out of loud places, you yeah. know, I have a hard time with big noise. I live in New York City, which is, <laughs> makes not, not the most <laughs> ideal place. But yes, art and music and film and the dog and, and my friends and, and that's about it. Nice. And what's the dog's name? Lily. Lily. Beautiful. Yeah. And how old is Lily? She's about a year and a half now. Oh, so you've been busy. I have been busy, <laughs> and she's a little year. too big to lug around with me Aww. on the road, but I'm, I'm bringing up the courage to, to, to put her in a bag and taking her with me from now on. Great. And where do you like to channel? And I'm specifically, obviously, you go all over, mm -hmm. but I'm curious, actually, first, I should say, what, what's your experience of countries and channeling? Are there certain countries that you have found are perhaps a little more um, ready for channeling or inviting of channeling or...? I don't, I mean, I, my international travel's been somewhat limited with mm. this work. I work in London, you know, um, you know, every year, and I spend a lot of time in Canada and Mexico. Mm. Because of the way I work, I'm sort of needing an English-speaking audience. It would be hard yeah. for any translator, I think, to keep up mm. with the level of transmission. It's often coming a mile a minute, although I'd love to work in Berlin and I'd love to work in Amsterdam. And there, the books are now being translated into more languages, so I expect that there'll be another audience who's able to attend to the teaching as well. My favorite place to work is Esalen in Big mm. Sur. And um, Esalen's really where I got my start. I was invited out of the blue pretty much to channel at a conference um, 
with some scholars and scientists in attendance. It was an invitational conference. I'd really never channeled outside of my living room, but the guy organizing the conference had come to my living room and saw what I did. And I had just gotten the first book back from Kinko's. It was still hot and I put it in the suitcase to take with me there because you had to put your books out. And I didn't have any published books, but yeah. everybody else certainly did. They had these stacks. Yeah. And there was me with my typo-ridden manuscript with the, you know, the, the binding from Kinko's. And the editor at Penguin happened to be one of the presenters there. And he took the manuscript back with him on the plane. And I think he wrote me from the plane and then had me in his office in a few days. And the book was out in months. It was never even submitted. But Esalen has been ground zero for this work, and the guides have delivered large portions of three books there mm. in front of students. And, and it's a place where I've thus far felt very supported, you know, by a community. And one of the things that I miss from my old life in academia was community. I had people that I worked with every day, and, you know, I was at NYU for 25 years, so you certainly build up a way of being with, with your colleagues. And now I'm like an itinerant minister, you know, I go from town to town. And I am grateful whenever I have the opportunity to do this work in front of a regular group of students. So I get that at Esalen. Mm, beautiful. And I'm curious, this is probably the last thing I'm going to ask you today. So anything that you could share with somebody who maybe is, is new to you and your uh -huh. work through this interview, uh, are there a few key truths that the guides like to deliver or that the work circles around? Sure. Well, I mean, there's some things that they say all the time, and they say you can't be the light and hold another in darkness. And they say the action of fear is to claim more fear, and every choice you make in fear gets you more of the same. And all you really have to do is look at your life and the last choice you made in fear, and you'll probably find out that that's true. It's a teaching of realization. You know, the new book is, you know, called Realization, Beyond the Known, Realization. It's about, and the guides say realization is knowing, it's true knowing, and the realization of who one truly is as an aspect of source, you know, invites you to become participatory to a landscape that is all things expressing at that level of vibration and tone, which is where they're bringing us. So. You know, it's, the, the work is experiential. The guides dictate these books that are energetic transmissions that work on the reader. And that's been, you know, exciting because I can only be so many places, but the books will attune people and, you know, and, and bring them to this place that they call the upper room where they say they may know themselves and their world in a new way. Hmm. Beautiful. And that, that makes me think when you were mentioning, say, Berlin and Amsterdam, both places I love and I've worked and they're mm -hmm. awesome places to do this kind of work. Whether you have translators in the room or not, it's kind of irrelevant because people will just be happy to be in the room with the transmission uh -huh. uh, and the energy of it, which I think is what people who really know channeling really get about mm -hmm. channeling. It's, you, you have to be careful studying the words too closely because sometimes the words will lead you in, in directions that won't necessarily always have an answer. It just depends. Mm. But the energy behind the rhythm and, and, and where you're being led is, is so much part of it. So I will ask you one last thing. Were there any channelers that you were aware of or that you saw or... Yeah, who were you most aware of before you started doing this? Well, I'd read half a Seth book mm. when I was a grad student between, you know hanging out in the bars, I'd go back and read some of that. I didn't finish the book, but I think it actually had a big impact on me. And I, somebody must have given it to me because I wouldn't have sought it out in those days. And when I was coming into my own awareness, there were a couple of channels that I became aware of. Um, Sinea Roman's mm. work, I remember that early on, but I actually stopped reading channeled work. Mm and really other authors, you know. I've read your book, you know, and, um, but mostly I, I have a library full of books that I haven't read. I buy everybody's book, then I don't read them. And part of the reason is I wanna keep things clear. Yeah. I try to keep the transmission clear. So there are people in the world who I admire, but I may not really have seen their work or certainly studied it. So at that level, I, I know 
the, the people that are known who are channeling out there, mm. but truthfully, I've not read any of their work. No, which makes total sense, and I get that, and I too have a million books that I've never read, but I, I like having them there. I like mm -hmm. having, you know, it, there's something about the energetic vibration of a book. Mm -hmm. I have this belief about channelers uh, that, that we kind of get initiated by somebody. I was taken to see a channeler before I started channeling and mm -hmm. was a little skeptical about channeling. I was very into mm -hmm. self-growth and metaphysics, but I wasn't quite sure what I felt about channeling. And I've met many channelers over the years who had a similar experience. They were given a book. It's like a touch paper and, mm -hmm. and it kind of ignites something in you. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much for being here. It's been lovely to talk to you about all the great work you're doing and a little bit about your experience of it. So thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. You have been listening to Impact the World. For more of my work, please visit leeharrisenergy.com. And to attend my five-day Impact the World in-person training event held in Scottsdale, Arizona in April 2020, visit leeharrisenergy.com forward slash impact.